Just think of it as the rough draft of the podcast world. This is the Newbie Writers Podcast with your host, Damien Boat and Catherine Bramkamp. Hey, this is episode 176 of the Newbie Writers Podcast, and I'm just wondering, is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> You can phone it in. That would be great. I know. This sucks. Can't help it. Anyway, so yes, I have the touch of the lurgies. Um, it's not tuberculosis. We've moved on from that in society. No, nope, we have. Mm. It's just the same old, uh, the same old tonsil thing you've got going. I know, but I was, I was in the doctor's surgery, and the doctor coughed, and I said, "Oh, you've got the cough too." <laughs> <laughs> He looked at me like, don't even start. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> nice try, but no deflection here. Yeah. It's all about you still. It's the Black Death. It's fine. There you go. <laughs> anyway, what are we doing today? See, today we have Denise Brousseau, who is a thought leadership strategist, and we're going to unpack that a little bit so we can understand what that is. Mm -hmm. And I met Denise uh, during Day of the Book last March and loved what she had to say, so she, she kindly agreed to come on our show today. So it's... Day of the book, is that like a play on words of Day of the Dead? I don't know, but that would be funny to uh, to combine that. No, Day of the Book is what my, my colleague, Connie Van Gilder, came up with to call that, to call the conference. This was our second year doing it. It, it worked third year. Third year. It worked beautifully, and I hope to do it again next year. Nice. Wow. Denise, welcome. Thank you. Oh, I seem to have lost her volume a little bit for some reason. Okay, can you hear me now? Well, no, it's still quiet. It was perfect before, and I haven't touched a thing. I don't know, I have a lighter. Great. Come on in. I love Skype. Anyway, um, I wonder what we'll do is we'll try and give her a quick call back and see if that'll reset everything. Yeah. Oh, anyway, so tell me about day of the book while I'm calling her back. Oh, remember we had we had a, a conversation about it in the during the March uh, during the March shows. Yes. But it's a it's a one day conference for writers and authors and readers, and so that's why we wanted to emphasize the book part. And so we you know we talked about the future of books, and we did con you know conversations about writing poetry, writing poetry. that kind of that kind of those kinds of subjects. Hmm. Well, Denise is back on. I've got an echo now. Can't win. <laughs> you to try there you go thank you i yeah i had an echo too i hate that better now nope <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying one you're more so time. quiet i don't know i'm speaking at full voice and i'm right in front of my computer there you go there you go got better i don't know what i'm doing it's different i'm there you go that's better okay um, can you hear me now oh it's that no. Okay. I wonder if it's my internet connection. It could be. Could also be if you've got Skype to set up to um, adjust your volume automatically too. I don't even think I would know how to do that. So. Uh, oh, Skype has taken a dump today. That's all right. We lost Catherine now. No, I'm oh, right no? here. I'm just not talking. Oh, no, it dropped you off on my screen. But anyway. Oh, it did. Oh, yep. no, I'm... I, I think my screen I'm still has me. On Skype, is that better? There you go. I typed, I, I found a little another button for <laughs> increasing <buttons> volume. Work. <laughs> nice. All right. Is that better? Yes, it's perfect. Yes. Um, I'm glad we got there. Now, we do have a question for you. Well, how do you become a thought leader? How do you become a thought leader? Mm. I would say the best way is to start by being a change agent. Oh. Because to, to me, you have to have something you're trying to change in the world uh, and be out helping others do that. And so it all starts by being a change agent. I see. That makes sense okay. And do you have a special club like MI6? <laughs> yeah. We have secret handshakes and winks. Awesome. It's, it's awesome. <laughs> Right. So tell me, let's walk, walk through a little bit on being a change agent, because as soon as you said that, I thought, aha, this could very well be part of a writer's 
platform is that change agent component. So uh, walk us through a little bit about what would be the process if a person says wakes up one morning and says, oh, I've recovered from my cold and now I'm going to be a change agent. That, that, change agent. <laughs> I do think it's really tied with being a, a writer because it's all about your public voice. It's all about uh, being a thought leader. It's all about getting word out about things that you have underway. And so for me, you start often in an organization, in a community, in a company, really trying to make something happen. And then you need to get others on board with that. And so you start internally and uh, Within with whatever community you're playing, and that is often about you know being better at using your presentation skills. It's better at using some social media. It's getting better at framing your thoughts in a way that others can buy into. And to me, thought leadership is building on that initial effort to now build others, maybe you know eventually a movement, but build others' uh, expertise and knowledge about what you've done. So it's sharing that change that you were you hopefully successfully brought about. It's sometimes you you know sometimes you're less successful, and so you can also talk about that. But it's this idea of being someone who is the go-to uh, advisor or expert on a, in an arena and sh willing to share that, willing to build uh, a whole group of followers around new ideas. Okay, how do you let how do you let people know that you're available as? A as so as a as a go to person, do you do you put up a little banner ad that says go to person on Facebook, or is it more organic than that? It completely depends on the person, and I would say that the the funny thing people come to me as as a thought leader strategist, and they say, so should I want to be a thought leader? Should I start a Twitter account? And and I always look at them kind of funny and say, well, do you have anything to tweet about? I mean, this is it's it, people frequently go to what are the what are the modes of communication, whereas I always start with what is it you're trying to communicate. But okay. modes, okay. you know, obviously modes. One of them is of course podcasts. Another is writing a book. A third might be social media, but often it's standing in front of a small group and even doing a brown bag lunch. I mean, this is, I always encourage people to think, how could I convene a group of people who needs to know what I know? And let's okay. begin there. And where could you do that? In, internally, in your community, in your organization, and in, in your company, to bring the right people to the table. One of the first steps in being a thought leader is being that convener of, of ideas and, and people who share and engage on the topic. Not, the old style is that sage from the stage, I know all, this is Oz, we will tell you. It, and that's not thought leadership, is that conversation and engagement. I'm getting some weird noise from you. Are you, you moving around for a minute there? Um, I do have a question there. You help CEOs, don't you? Yeah. Uh, some CEOs, some executives in companies, some nonprofit leaders. And is that because a lot of them aren't necessarily natural born leaders? They just get thrust into that role? I don't think so. Uh, I think it's actually a different conversation. I think it's that you tend to believe when you are the CEO of an entity or when you're leading an initiative or a team that this public voice is important. And you start to recognize that having more influence, having more impact is going to change your future are going to change the future of your initiative, the change you're trying to bring underway. And so you start to realize that getting some help around that is pretty critical. Now, it is absolutely true, Damien, that some of those people have been thrust into leadership and don't think about themselves mm. as fully effective and absolutely true. I mean, probably many of us are in, in thrust into a bigger role than we expect, but, the, but then recognizing that having some better skills as a communicator, better skills as building followers can can move that message or that change much more quickly. But how do you deal with then people below you that have very poor communication skills? But there is a couple of ways to do that. I mean, one of them is sending them to some great classes, and I have a, a whole sort of Rolodex of people and, and classes and programs that I can send them to. But that's not usually the problem, and um, what it usually is the problem is actually being able to distill complex ideas into simple ideas. <laughs> into <That's> simple people. <laughs> Pardon? Distill complex ideas into simple people. Yeah. <laughs> that too. 
Mm. Because we tend to speak in our own jargon, right? We tend to speak in our own community's world where everybody understands us. But as soon as we step out, whether we're from technology or whether we're from public government or whatever role we play, to be able to distill something in a way that attracts followers, attracts people to want to read your your uh, your book or listen to your podcast, you've got to distill it in a way that potentially using metaphor or making it fun and engaging or having some sort of call to action. There's all of these are often new skills for people that they just haven't had to stretch and grow before. Hmm. Well, I don't think I'll call a, a cable in my business a doof, doohickey. That would be bad. <laughs> Yeah, and so that's the difference, right? We aren't trying to dumb it down. We're trying to make it accessible. So there is a, mm. a definite nuance to it. I think the problem for experts is that they get a little insulted when you first start the conversation because they think, oh, she just wants me to dumb this down for a five-year-old. It's like, no. This is simplifying it in a way that others can both understand but also do something with the knowledge that they've just gotten. So there's a guy that I interviewed for my book, and uh, he's a quite a thought leader in the world of search engine optimization. And he, he used this great term that I love. He says, my job is to uncomplexify. And I thought, yes, that's it, right? It's not a real word in the dictionary, but it's exactly what you want to say here. We as thought leaders need to uncomplexify whatever world we live in so that others can get up to speed more quickly, can take new ideas and adopt them. That's our work. And that's and that's not only work, It's an, there's an art to it. You know, some people are brilliant at looking at their own industry and then coming up with the appropriate metaphors that will convey, thus the name metaphor is Greek for convey, to convey their ideas. And I'm, and I'm thinking primarily like in mathematics or in science or in, as you said, you know, something that's very complex, but crucial for people to understand. And so I think that, do you, do you work with people on how to actually manage their language and and turn something that's complex into something that is that is more readily accessible and i also and you can also speak to and I, I like telling people what they can do i come across that with a lot of my students where they'll give you a great big problem and then i'll say well that's lovely but you didn't tell me what i could do about it did you <laughs> Yes, it's both. It's both and. So, absolutely, part of the part of the work is distilling messages and even maybe distilling a framework. So, here's the seven step process that you could take. Here's the the five key components of of successfully transitioning from A to B. Those. So, we do a lot of work around that uh, that conversation. And then the second piece is the and there is a solution here. I mean, we don't want thought leaders to be the dooms tellers, oh, the world is coming to an end and whatever our world is. No, but we expect them to, in some ways to be the pathfinders. We expect them to be the trailblazers, the people who can give us the steps forward and craft a future that we can both live into but also step into. So we want to have those steps outlined for us. And that was a lot of learning for me in writing this book for myself was – and the work that I do with my clients is to understand that this framework, this distilling the steps is such a crucial difference between leaders and thought leaders. Leaders are really, let's go, we're going, here's the direction we're going and we're moving forward. But, but thought leaders have to be able to distill what happened in a way that others can now do the same thing. And that's, those are somewhat different skills. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you go about then um, putting a book together? To consolidate all that so it's actually clear and concise well the truth is I actually started by teaching it uh, I started by doing it then I started helping others do it and then I started teaching it so those are really the steps I my own journey to becoming a thought leader was really very accidental I in the early days of the internet I was running a nonprofit working with women entrepreneurs and the internet bubble was really going crazy here in Silicon Valley and I suddenly became this go-to person in the world of women's entrepreneurship and venture capital and high growth companies and got calls for speaking and writing and, and appearing on radio and television and all kinds of different opportunities to really spread this message that I felt extremely passionate about. But when I look back, I didn't think of myself as being a thought leader. I was super passionate about this topic and really making a change in, in women and venture capital. But the truth is, 
five years later, I got a call from a friend of mine saying, hey, so you know how you became a thought leader in women's entrepreneurship? I want to do that in my world. And that was the first time that I'd ever sort of accepted in my mind that phraseology or that delineation that I had made that journey. So we sat down together and over the next couple of years took her from completely unknown to being a well-respected thought leader in her industry, testifying in front of the Senate, her company was recognized by the White House for the, the initiative she'd started, headhunted by the governor to go run a, a similar initiative statewide. And at, at, it was during that journey, those three years of helping her, that I realized that there is a step-by-step -step process. That for me, it was pretty accidental and very fortunate. I was uh -huh. rare, it's needed, right? But then I realized, wow, you can actually do this with a plan. So then I started, I had an opportunity to do a workshop at a conference and, and the woman said, well, what would you like to teach? And I said, well, I'd really like to teach what I just learned from doing this. And so I invited a friend over who's sort of a curriculum developer and we mapped out what, what I'd learned, a um, huge chart on the wall. And, and then we broke it down into how do you teach this? And then I went and taught it. And about a year later, I got an opportunity from, uh, from Wiley to, to write a book and I pitched that document that she and I had created to say, here, what if, what if I wrote a book about this? And the woman said, yes, <laughs> let's write that. So that was really the journey for me was sort of what did I, was distilling what I had done, distilling what my client had done and realizing then, okay, there is a process here. But then I went out and interviewed a ton of other people to make sure I wasn't making this up. You know, two isn't really a, okay. isn't really a big subset here. So we got to, we got to get some additional people. So then I went out and interviewed some really very well-known thought leaders uh, to double check my, my steps. That's what we're doing. But we, we haven't put a cap on the amount of people we're interviewing yet. <laughs> we're just doing it. Mm. So fun. The interviewing phase is so fun, isn't it? I, so much. Yeah, oh yeah, be. it's just like it's just like the research phase in a in a dissertation. It's like, oh, the research is so fun. Do I really have to write it? Oh. It's more fun yeah. to talk to people. I agree. Really fun. I, and I met some great people. So did you have, just so people can consider, you know, so our listeners can think of this, did you have when you were when you said, okay, I am going to, you know, write this book and I want to make sure that I got it right. So I'm going to call a, you know, expert A, expert B, and expert C and get their opinions. How did you go about that? Because that can be a little daunting if we feel like, you know, oh well I'm just, you know, a regular person trying to put this book together and you, famous person a and respected person B and Dr. C um, are probably, you know, much too busy to talk to the likes of me. How do you get past that and how did you approach your people to get their interviews? Catherine, such a great question and I wish I'd known better at the beginning. Uh, and it really what got me through it was sitting down at a dinner one night next to a friend of mine who'd written a book and asking her almost that identical question, like, how do you do that? And, and she really... <laughs> And, and she was very good at starting with this, which is what I'd like to start with, which is so much of this is a decision between our own ears, right? We have to decide that this book needs to get out in the world. Thus, we need to talk to these people and we need their help in making it a better book. And once I got out of it being about me and that made it about that this book could really be helpful to others, I got a little bit out of my own way because I was telling myself a story that who's going to take my call? I mean, whatever, you know, what that whole, as I yeah. read in the book, right? I call it the itty bitty shitty committee is one of my clients. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that committee shows up in spades when you're trying to do a fear inducing project like that. So she was the first person that sort of talked me down from that ledge, as it were. And second, it was just for her to remind me that I do have a network. And I think we all have a network more than we actually use it. We have built up some loyalty over the years, as I call it in the book, loyalty equity, that this sense that people do owe me a favor or two. I've done some good things in my career. So why couldn't I call in some of those favors or those those chits that I've been earning and never used. So I really uh -huh. just reached out to anybody and everybody. And, and just to tell a story of myself, I had to because my network is 90%, 95% women. I've spent my career working with women leaders. My clients are women leaders. The, you know, I have a few male clients over the years, but most of the people I know are women leaders. And I, so I knew a ton of women thought leaders. I didn't know any guys. 
So I had the embarrassing thing of calling up women friends of mine and saying, so tell me, do you know any male thought leaders? And they thought this was the funniest thing because of course <laughs> all they knew. Right? And there were so many more. So, you know, that was the second step was to really just put myself baldly out there and get names and then at, write, draft a very crisp um, two, three paragraph email that then I would invite them to forward. So it was, you know, here's what I'm trying to do. Here's why it matters. Here's some points I'm trying to make. Would you be willing? And uh -huh. that, they then sent that for me. So was, in some cases, I'd have three people triangulate on the same person that I wanted to interview. Some people, you know, I kind of knew that was a really close personal um, connection for someone Then I would just use one. Um, uh -huh. And one person I just found on Twitter. I mean, I just started following this guy on Twitter and I thought he is so compelling. So I tweeted to him, would you take a call? And he was lovely and absolutely said yes. So it was completely about reaching out in every direction. I kind of just looked through my LinkedIn. I looked through my Rolodex. I started thinking about people I'd worked with before. And then I just had to be bold and brave. And the truth is, 98% of them said yes. And the ones who didn't, it was either, you know, you never heard back at all. So you didn't know what it was about, or they were just traveling, busy, whatever. Yeah. And so yeah. it was personal. But so many people were incredibly generous with their time and, and enjoyed it. I think in some ways, many people are, even if they're quote unquote famous, many of the times they're interviewed, it's for something about their company. It's rare that they get to tell their own story. So I think okay. that was also something that I gave them a chance to tell me their journey to be a thought leader and, and what was it, their skill set, what were the behaviors, the attributes, all of these things that are personal that people do like to talk about, I learned. So as long as you get people talking about themselves, you're in, you're in good shape. I, I mean, I take it beyond. It doesn't say that you don't talk about their business or their product or whatever it is that you want to learn about, uh, their their company, their their leadership journey, all of those are important. But I think it's also important to ask these other pieces. And that is often when people will light up. To, if you give the same, if you ask the same old, same old questions, people are bored. You know, they've already done seven of those interviews. But to, instead to be someone who's a little bit creative or willing to go a little further, uh, I think you get a better interview and you get more of the knowledge you really need to, to write a great book. Did you, um, did you give all of, now here's, here's a question just on structure. Did you give the same questions to all of your interviews so that you had some consistency with the responses so that everybody, everybody said how they got to where they were and then everybody explained the three steps that got them there or did you vary the questions? I wish I was that organized, Catherine. I am I'm not that <laughs> <laughs> No, I did not. Um, often, instead of doing that, I followed the structure of the book. So I had, you know, with my uh, developmental editor, I'd come up with an outline of what the book chapters would be. And so what I was trying to do in the interview was to hone in on which section was there a more interesting part of the story? Like if there was okay. somebody that was okay. referred to me that had a really great framework, I interviewed them in depth about their framework for the framework chapter. I didn't then worry quite so much if I knew where they fit in some of the others. But then I often, okay. everybody got asked questions about one chapter, which was the chapter about really getting over your fear, which I call putting your eye on the line. And because I, I realized there was such richness in that conversation about how do you get beyond that voice in your head? How do you get beyond the naysayers around you? How do you get beyond the, 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 the public um, perception that you're self-aggrandizing or self-promoting? And so that, I asked those questions of pretty much everyone, but then for everything else, I, I focused in often with the help of whoever referred them or something I knew about them to focus in on where I knew they would be a better fit in the book. Very good. Very good. Now, what I do sometimes, I do the interviews for the um, the Women's National Book Association, San Francisco, and so I have an interview in there every every month with a member. And what I find helps is I go on to their website, I go look at their books on Amazon, and then from there I sort of I can craft what I hope and so far have 
have been more interesting questions than just the standard questions. Do you do that kind of research? Do you recommend that kind of research when people are looking to get quotes from their, you know, their famous contributors to be contributors? I recommend it for two reasons, and I'm sure you, you hit on one of them, which is you just have a better interview. But the second is you're a whole lot more credible to the other person on the other end if you've done your homework. And so the likelihood that they are they're going to dismiss you if they have to repeat something pretty basic that you could have found out on their LinkedIn profile. Yeah. Um, I, I sort of look at it as uh, one of my favorite shows is in, Inside the Actors Studio with you know, James Lipton. And, you know, he comes with 250 cards with different questions for his interviewees. And he's done more thorough research than anyone on the planet before he interviews someone. Now, I'm never going to be James Lipton, but that to me is the right model to really think I should know so much about this person that that the interview is going to be smooth because I'm always going to have another direction to turn. On the other yeah. hand, you're writing a book, you never have that kind of time. So I, I tried to do my best and you know, at least spend an hour to an hour and a half, probably an okay. hour, you know, researching somebody before or or interviewing someone who knew them or whatever. And and truthfully, I also got to interview people that I had worked with in the past or clients of mine, and I knew their story. So that yeah, a lot that's easier. Yeah, not less bad. Yeah, but most definitely. So what was your takeaway when you, so you, you, you put the book together, you launched it out into the world. What has, it, what has writing the book done for you in your role as a thought leader about thought leaders? <laughs> well, first of all, that was when I wrote the book. It was when the book came out was the first time anybody had called me a thought leader about thought leadership. And I just thought that was so funny. It's <laughs> <laughs> Of course it is. That's why I said it. <laughs> It's such a wonderful concept there. So it's pretty bold of me to think that I can be a thought leader about thought leadership. But um, what is what has really come about is I can only call it as magic that the for many years, I'd, many years ago, let me put it this way, many years ago, I had the opportunity to write a book and I was really, really burned out. And at the time I had a book contract, I had a uh, ghostwriter that I'd hired and, you know, I had a lot of the, I had an agent, I had a lot of the things in place, but I was seriously completely burned out. And so I walked away from that opportunity. So 10 years later, when I got the opportunity again, I jumped on it. I was not going to let that opportunity passed the second time. Uh, so I was really determined to do the book. And I don't think I had imagined or really spent a lot of time putting myself in that future when the book was done. Certainly, I'd done a little of that visioning with uh, various folks that I'd like to do that kind of work with, but not, not really sort of owning what was the possibilities. And the possibilities have been quite endless. I mean, not only new clients who discover me online or read my guest blogs or found the book or, um, but also opportunities to speak, opportunities to, to, to guest blog around the world, to do fun podcasts, to be involved in, in, in days of the book and other kinds of wonderful book events. Um, people sending the most lovely emails saying, thank you. You know, your book really helped me, really touched me. Friends saying, I you know, gave your book to five people. I just thought it was so important that people have this. You know, just things that you That's never nice. imagined. Yeah. You just never imagined that. And, and it's, such a, it's such a sweetness because to me, the fun is definitely the launch and not the writing part. <laughs> I think you and I talked a little bit about this. Some people, I think, really love to write. And that is the joy. For me, I'm an extrovert. I like to be out in the world. So having the book gave me an opportunity to be in front of many more audiences and in talking to people that I cared about in a way that I couldn't before. So that was the real gift. But all that hard work, or as my, my friend calls it, who's my book coach, she said, the most important thing when you're writing a book is bum glue. Glue your bum to the chair and don't <laughs> <laughs> I always love that line. And so that, once I was able to let go of the glue and go out in the world, that was such a pleasure. Such a pleasure. That is, and you are very, you are very different than about 90% of the authors I know where, where it's all about creating the book and then they launch it and then they're horrified that they have to promote it. So it's, it's like, no, that's not the good time. So I think that, that's interesting. You're the other way. Yes, I'm the other way. I'm, first of all, I'm an extrovert. Second of all, I started my career in marketing and spent many years marketing other companies' products. And so it doesn't, I'm com 
I have no hesitation to recognize the importance of marketing a book and having worked as hard as I did on it, that seems like a natural next step for me. And sure, I haven't done all the thousands of things that some people can can tell me I should do. I'll never get, I'll never have enough time in the day to do all the marketing I could do. But yes, I do find this the fun part. And, and that is, that is different than most authors I've met. Oh, most definitely. So let me ask you about that. Cause that's an interesting, you make an interesting descriptor <laughs> for, um, for promotion, which would be the word fun. Um, <laughs> not what I hear all, normally. Tell me a, a little bit about what did you choose? Because I think that I'm, what I'm seeing in social media is that there needs to be some choices. So how did you make it fun? What worked to you? What were the fun outlets that got you energized and then also promoted the book? So what, what were your choices? Well, let me step back and ask, answer a question just before that question, which is how did I plan this? Because I, I run strategic planning sessions with companies. That's one of the parts of the work that I do. And so I got an opportunity during the book launch, I got an opportunity to go take a brand new course on uh, a new kind of planning called compression planning. And we had to bring to the three-day course, we had to bring something we were planning. So okay. I, I'm planning the launch of my book. And so they said, okay, we'll come up with a strategic question around that, something that really will, quote unquote, energize you. And so I came up with the question, which is what would make this book launch the most fun I've ever had? Okay. And so that was the strategic question. And then I got to work with three or four people, you know, just using the compression planning tool. And the way the tool works is you have this sort of a bulletin board where you put push pins and you get a whole bunch of index cards and you put your strategic question up and you put all the background to the book and who the audience is and, and on different cards. And then you invite people to come over and brainstorm with you, as it were, different ideas. And so I got these bright people who knew nothing about me or my book to come and help me, like talk to me about how did they have launch books or how do they find out about books. And that uh -huh. board, as it were, all the stuff that, that happened, oh, then you prioritize and then you put a plan together from that. It's all part of the, the compression planning. So I did the whole thing and then I brought it home and I put the bulletin board up in my office and every index card was a task. It was like, okay, I got to do this. I got to do that, whatever it might be. So it was both the pieces of the book itself, getting the testimonials done, getting the front cover done, you know, all those fun pieces that we so love. And then it was the next piece was, okay, what are the different things I'm going to do? So was it, you know, universities was one angle. Um, I'm very involved with a number of universities, both that I've gotten to go to school at, but also others that I have connections to. So I sort of had a university set of things that I could do, reaching out to different folks who might invite me to speak. Then I had a I had a topic about podcasts. And so I got my assistant to do some sleuthing on what were some podcasts were that talked about influence and impact and things that I wanted to talk about and, and about yeah. books. Very right. So there was different sections and under each section there was some cards and then I would just kind of pull them off or star them or whatever, move them to the done pile as I finished. But having this visual reminder in my office every day of what was ahead and there was things that I really wanted to do on there that it made it fun. It made it, I'm not saying, I don't think that it really was the most fun I ever had in my life. <laughs> I won't go that far. But I did have some really highlight moments and some of them were due to those strategies that I put in place. Did you pull, uh, and I'm just thinking, because I, I coach as well. And so, you know, you, you, you get, you go to the seminar, here's, here's the typical response and yours is not the typical response. So you go to this great seminar and you get, and that's a really good idea to have other people brainstorm particularly about you know how do you find out about a book my sister-in-law asked that question she says how do people know about your book it's like damn that's a really good question um, <laughs> you have you go to the go to the seminar you get the cards you get the big roll of paper you get the butcher paper you go home you put it up in your study you put everything up and you immediately ignore it completely for three weeks mm -hmm. so that's the first phase <laughs> and then did you get to the point where you you pulled off a card and you said, wow, I was really excited about this on my drive home, but now it just looks awful. How did you cope with that? Oh yeah, there was definitely things that other people, both, both that other people suggested and I agreed to that, you know, I brought it home and I'm like, there's no way 
I'm going to do that. Okay. So, yes, of course. And the good news is that even after everybody did the strategizing with me, they didn't get to do the prioritizing. I got to do the prioritizing. And even at that point, I took things off. And you know, it wasn't to hurt anybody's feelings that their idea was that there's only a certain number of hours in every day and only yeah. a certain number of months in a book launch. So part of it was prioritizing uh, around what were the easier, low-hanging fruit with high um, outcomes. So for example, I have been a speaker for many years. And so reaching out to some of the places that I had spoken, I'm, I'm very involved with women's leadership. So I knew a lot of the women's leadership community. So reaching out to that, that's low hanging fruit. Plus it's my tribe. It's the people I love to spend time with. So those were the easy ones. And the yes, <laughs> excitement, can't wait to do those. And then there was the ones that were just energy drainers. And yeah. and it's, I think it's really important to note your own body's reaction to things because there are some that you get woohoo about and some of you are like, oh, please don't make me do that. And so either they stayed on the bulletin board and probably would have stayed up there until I took the whole board down a few months ago, or they never even made it to back onto the second bulletin board when it came home because there was no way. You're just not okay. going to do that. Why put them up there? It'll only make you depressed. Yeah, that's, and that's, that's just... You know, a piece of it that can be helpful. You know, if you look at, and I've I've done similar things, particularly with social media, is that you know you go into a program or you say to yourself, oh, you know, I should I should tweet about this or oh, I should call you know universities, and you, I I think you're right. There's a, a gut check to that saying I don't want to do this, and if you make yourself do it, probably it's not going to work because you didn't want to do it in the first place. Would you say that would be one of the outcomes? Now that yes and yes, but there's also a little caveat under that, which is if every single thing on the list that you know you need to do for marketing is a energy drainer, rather than throwing the whole list away, you need some help, and and yeah. you need to okay. hire, yes. hire some help. So I don't say throw it all away if it's not something you like to do. So for example, there were things I didn't know how to do as well as things I didn't want to do. And I did hire some help. So that was the other thing is delegate the things that you can't stand to do. Cool, cool, cool. If you don't have any money, you can make a child do it. I always I appreciate it. Oh, if I had kids, that would have been so helpful. Because <laughs> two of my friends told me that, that their kids help them with their video, and this one helped with the social media. And it's like, wait a minute, I should have had children. <laughs> I know. Too late. Damn. I forgot that one, right? <laughs> yeah, and then they move away, and they don't have time for you. I don't know what that's all about. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't they supposed to be eternally at your beck and call after tournament? I think so, and they're not following along with that program at all. <laughs> so, sure, sure, sure. Oh, darn it. You guys were so great when you were home and dependent. <laughs> you could exploit their talents. Oh, On the other hand, I don't want the money so, either. So we've got the book. We're really happy. What are your next um, what are your next steps then? What are your next projects? Well, that's such a fun question because, you know, there's a number of different directions to head. And for me right now, I've, I've found a partner in crime, as we've been calling ourselves. I found another thought leadership strategist from doing this book. And uh, let me say there was an interim step. A friend of mine, I ran into a friend whose also book came out about six months after I did. And we were both lamenting the fact that as authors, it's very hard to know what you don't know. I mean, how in the world do you ever pick up this stuff out of the ether. There's just no way. So we decided that we needed to start an email list for women authors. So we created this authoress's email list and invited the women authors we knew who then invited other women authors they knew. And, and it's mostly business authors because that's the kind of books that we both wrote. Okay. Although there's a few a teaching folks who are in there. And um, that actually led, to, I posted something on there at one point, and that led to this wonderful woman in Chicago who was on the list after a few months who's turns out does the work that I do. She has very different clients. She works with academics and she works with nonprofits more than I do. And I work more with, with corporate and entrepreneurs. And so, you know, we, we didn't directly compete, but there's so much yeah. work anyway to be done that we didn't worry about that. So, so we've kind of come together around doing some fun, fun antics in whatever that looks like. And the latest is to come up with a course. So we're doing a, we're co-creating an online course around thought leadership. And we just spent another hour on it this morning. And so we sort of divided it up into, into the different modules and figuring out who's doing what. And, and so that's one project that's, that's underway that I'm enjoying. Um, a year ago when I was, the book was launching, I did hire a, a curriculum instructor developer type person to help me come up with some worksheets that went with some of the exercises in the book. So we're going to take some of that and, and reuse it 
simultaneously, I'm taking some of the podcasts that I've been doing with others and trying to turn some of those into some fun eBooks. Uh, okay. So it's trying to think about other content. You know, what is it? How can I turn the book into other, other more approachable content, other ways to frame it in, in a way? Some people are visual learners. Some people don't love to read books. Some people like videos. And, you know, you know all this, right? So it's this idea of finding the different, different ways in which to present the information. Um, and then the question is, do I write another book? And I go back and forth. I, you know, I have two other possible books in mind. Um, the first one would be on, uh, you know, this book is really about individuals. How do individuals move from leader to thought leader, from sort of change agent to creating a following around their ideas and a movement? Now, what if you could write a similar book about companies and organizations? Or even people who don't know each other well but are trying to build a movement. So thinking thinking about something like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, you know, how did that come together? Those were not all people who had any relationship necessarily to one another prior to coming together around creating that movement. So I'd love to think about how do you how do you do that as a group strategically? You know, similarly, what are the steps? And the fun thing about it is I don't know the answer. So I'd have to go and do a lot of homework. So that's one book. And then the other is what if the other could be what if the movement fails? Like what happens when it doesn't work? And so looking at the failures, looking at the things that didn't take off, looking at the things that, that, that the missteps and the, the, the worst practices instead of the best practices. So <laughs> I think there is some, I think there's some learning to be done in both of those directions. And so I'm, uh, maybe I'm gearing up my energy to, to, to tackle another one. I don't know how you've written so many. I mean, I think it is a huge undertaking. So maybe it's because <laughs> yes. I'm launching about the writing part. Well, it can be, and I I love the writing part. It, it is hard, so you know it's not you know that's you know not easy at all. But it is satisfying to me. That's why I can that's why I can do it. Um, I like your idea about the um, the failures, and there's been a number of successful business books that track you know why did something start with such passion, and why did it fall apart? Because that, you know that happens more often than not. What do they say? Eighty five percent of small businesses fail in the first five years. That's something to be. That's something to pay attention to because with the internet and with the ability to do massive outreach, at least that's the promise. I don't know how effective it is. You know, can you can you create an Arab Spring again, or are there some pitfalls, or are there some unattended consequences? I think that's an interesting. I think that's an interesting question to ask. It really is, it, and and it's and in some ways those two books might be intertwined because yeah. It's not just individuals who fail at this. It's definitely once the movement gets started that the movement fails or, yeah. or has one of the movements that I'm very involved with is women's choice and women's access to abortion. And we're seeing things going backwards now. So it's also things that have made progress that had then the progress has gone the other way. And that's also interesting to me. Like, why are we having yeah. this terrible back? That's an interesting, so it's both how to build that, but then also how to prevent those, uh, times when things are moving in the wrong direction. You know, the backsliding. And, 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 you know, did, were there like last minute saves? Yes. Yeah. So I think there's a richness to that dialogue and even just thinking about, okay, how do you start <laughs> to do that? Yeah. yeah. It's not like call up somebody you know. It's, it's a much bigger question. So anyway, it's, it's going to happen. I, um, the, the fun thing is that everything we do takes us in lots of new directions. And, and so it's always that weeding process of, do I want to go this way? Because I have, what's <laughs> fun is the clients that have come out of this, the kinds of people who, who I get the chance to work with, whether they be a water lawyer or a, a head of a, a big foundation of foundations or, uh, you know, an, an entrepreneur with her own uh, incubator. You know, there's just lots of different people that, um, I have a chance to work with now because they found me through the book. And so that also can take up a lot of time. And then the question that you have yeah. to ask yourself is where is my highest best use and where is, yeah. where yeah. can I make the biggest impact and influence? Yeah. Very cool. Very so cool. if you were going to talk, talk to a newbie writer, someone who's just starting out, but let's say that let, let's, let's get them in this, they're very, passionate about a particular subject they really want to you know run with this what would be some of your first steps for someone who is you know new excited and ready to rock and roll 
what's fun about the answer to that question is I had an answer before I started writing the book and then a different answer after I started writing the book. So ah, like, really? Just, That's interesting. So what would be your, what was, what was your original thought about this before you started thought, writing the book? My thought was you should absolutely have a, a, um, the publisher in line. You should have the, the plan for your, for your audience, the, you know, sort of the, the, I come from a world of marketing. So as you imagine, I'm looking at the launch. That's kind of where I began. Uh, uh -huh. Very much like everyone around me, I get it. But that's where I began thinking that you start with who's my audience and, and how am I going to get to them and uh, that kind of piece, even as you're writing the book. So you have that audience in mind and that audience member that you're writing to. And I still think all of that is important, but I got a much faster shortcut while I was writing the book and I wish I'd gotten it earlier. I <laughs> And I put it in the book, it sort of as a last minute little section. Uh, this woman that I interviewed, she works at the D School at Stanford. She's a professor and Dr. Tina Selig. And I ran into her at an event at Stanford and she was chatting up somebody that I was with about how she does her books. And I don't know, she has 13 or whatever the number is. And so, of course, I'm eagerly e eavesdropping. And oh, yeah. She's, yeah. Right, because you always want to know. So she says what she does is she writes her outline. And then she makes a whole long list of all the people that she wants to interview for the book. And then she makes her first appointment and she makes her appointments at lunch. And then she sits at lunch with whoever the person is. Sometimes it's on the phone and sometimes it's in person, but she sits at lunch with the person and she takes handwritten notes while she's interviewing them. And then as soon as she finishes the interview, she sits and reads through her notes and she circles the most important things that she learned. Then she lets it sit, and then at night, just before she goes to bed, she reads those circled items, just the highlights, okay. and she lets it percolate in her brain overnight. And then the next morning, she gets an, up and she writes the section, whatever it would be, sort of her summary of, of where that would fit, or the part of the chapter, or the interview, whatever she wants to yeah. write up. Right. And then she does it again, and she does it again, and she does it again, and pretty soon she has a book. I'm like, well, that sounds a whole lot easier than what I did. <laughs> That is so great because that's exactly what I, you know, that's, that's what I do if I'm stuck with a plot point in a book is that I think about the plot point before I go to bed, go to sleep, wake up the next morning, start to write. And usually 95% of the time it comes out. You, you let your brain do some work, you know, without pushing it consciously. You let your subconscious. That's brilliant. I love that. It really is. And it, it is following the neuroscience and all of that, but it's also intuitively what we know that our brain knows the answers often and we just have to let it. Or as one of the guys I interviewed for the book says, he has a very loud judging voice. And so he's, but he realized if he would get up and write at three or four in the morning, that the judgment voice was still asleep, but his writing brain was awake. And I thought, ah. well, <laughs> There's a whole other way. So we all have to find our strategies for getting around the, whatever the impediments are. And some of the impediments are very much, I mean, for me, they certainly were my own voice or my own perfectionism or my own, for me, I thought the bar, as I was writing the book, the bar was so high that I felt I had to have this perfect book and that held me back from just sitting down and writing. And so whatever it is that gets you over that hurdle, uh, take it. That's my thinking. Yeah. yeah. A writing part. I had a, a writing buddy for a while. I had um, somebody who was sort of my accountability person that every week I'd have to tell her how many words I wrote. And I tried everything I could think of because I don't love the writing part. I tried everything I could think of to get my myself to, to sit down and write the book. Oh, I Dead love lines. that. What Dead was the lines. best strategy? If you if Dead. you went through all of those, what was your best strategy? It was all about the deadline. Honestly. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I had line that book never would have happened. So that's it. And, and so one other little strategy that I want to share that I think is really fun, and this was recommended by my book coach. Um, she's an author herself, Sam Horn, and she works with a lot of, of wonderful authors. And so I felt like a big gift to have her in my life as I was writing my book. And she's probably my biggest secret sauce. But one of the things she, she taught me was this piece about um, having a team of friendly editors. So 
my book deadline, my first deadline was February 15th. So I finished the first draft January 1 with the intention, full intention of inviting people to come and read. And so I'm fortunate yeah. and I have a, a book club. I've been in the same book club for, I don't know, at the time it was 15 years. And so I had invited all my book club friends to come and read. And then I invited other people from other walks of life. And each, I had three different nights um, that were set aside. And so there was nine chapters. So it was three chapters, the first three chapters, the second three chapters, the third. And one person came to each, to all of them, but most people came to one. And uh -huh. they would get a copy of the three chapters. And some of them read one chapter, some read all three. And then they got a red pen or whatever they wanted. And they got a glass of wine and some dinner. And they sat and edited. And so my request, and I wrote it on the first page, you know, my request is, Please note anything that doesn't make sense. Please note any time where I miss, yeah. you know, the go from A, B, C to H. Um, please note jargon. Please note. So I had a sort of a list of things I was looking for. Yeah. And it was, first of all, it was terrifying, but also, <laughs> right? Because, ah, there's your friend sitting there critiquing your book. What if they hate it? But um, because I made it fun, and that was part of the fun thing, made it dinner and made it um, engaging, and they all knew each other, or most of them knew each other, uh, that all worked well. And there was only one person that was, in a, was initially, I thought, going to be very ineffective. She came in, she sat down, she took her pen, she took her glass of wine, and she did not get up for three hours. Oh, and wow. she wrote, and she wrote, and she wrote, and she wrote, and I, I, I couldn't. Catherine, I couldn't even look at it when I was done. I, mean, <laughs> I put it aside for a few days. I'm like, I was yeah. terrified. What if she hated it? And yeah. she gave me a big hug and she left. Well, I didn't actually know that she had been a college professor. Oh, years so, before yeah. before I met her. Right? So she just had that whole skill set about how do you critique. Well, she gave the best critique. It was so fair, but it was so pointed. And it was just the kind of feedback you're dying for at that oh. stage. Yeah, definitely. It was huge. That is good. And I do a similar thing with my beta readers, only I just fire it out and then they, you know, they come back. So I haven't thought about bringing them in and because <laughs> they're a little far flung for that. But I think you're, I think you're right. I think getting those for any work, getting those initial readers, especially if they're not familiar with your genre, they, they bring a whole nother view to it that is just, you know, I, I, I want to say is it, it, it's irreplaceable. I mean, they're fabulous. It is. And, and uh, uh, January 1, you know, I honestly, I was so proud of myself. It's like, woohoo, I'm done, I'm early, blah, blah, blah. And my friend was here who's written, I don't know, seven books. And she turns to me and she says, you know, Denise, that you have seven or eight more drafts left to go. And I remember <laughs> looking at her and going, I'm thinking to myself, I've never hated anyone more than I hate yes. you. At this <laughs> You are no longer my friend. You are dead to me. <laughs> right, that's right. But she, of course, was absolutely right. And I think this is the thing we need to share with everybody who's a DB writer. The shitty first draft is not a joke. It's not for other people. It's for everybody. You yeah. always have a shitty first draft. There is nothing that's going to avoid that. And the gift of other editors of all different kinds. I mean, I had... I had the best gift was my mother, who is turns out is the best grammarian and knows exactly where the hyphen versus the dash versus the period versus the comma goes. She read every chapter, every draft. She's the only person who read every word of the book through every draft. And she was oh. that, it was awesome. And it really brought That's the awesome. two of us together. That was such a gift. And then yeah. I had yeah. the, the company, the, the well, Wiley's developmental editor, the original person that I, when she left, I had a second person that I had all these friends and uh and then at the very end my book was too long and i hired a friend of mine who i know very well and i said i just gave it the thing i'm like okay just you have to cut fifteen thousand words i want to cut this chapter in this chapter and i can't look at it Don't yeah take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and she, so i think our, our conclusion is almost um it takes a village it takes a village please call all your friends please expect they will help you and please in some ways demand that they help you this is this is a quid pro quo for for being your friend that they should be willing to offer whatever role they can play if they're really good at commas then they go do that if they really like to you know help with a little research terrific if they can cut bring them on yeah. whatever it is they all have a different role to play and so i guess if you're early in your career make a lot of friends because you're going to need them. yeah you're going to need them totally. So Denise, tell us where the, um, tell us where we can find your book and where we can find you. Well, the 
best place to find me is on my website, which is thoughtleadershiplab.com. And the Amazon sells my book, Barnes and Noble. Uh, so lots of bookstores, et cetera. But the website, Thought Leadership Lab, has it all together. And I have a ton of resources on there. I have, if you join my email list, you get um, an ebook. And then I also have some uh, worksheets that come, that go uh, to each chapter of the book that are that go with the exercises in the book. Um, there's a really fun Thought Leadership Manifesto that you can download on the website. So there's lots of great stuff there. And cool. I've tried to helpful and useful for people. And I, and I engage on Facebook, I'm on LinkedIn. So it's kind of, you find me on Twitter. I'm, I put her under thought leader lab, uh, spelled a little unusually. So if you search under my name, it's probably easier. Uh, but the, I'm, I like to be pretty ubiquitous and I love to connect with people. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your thoughts and for that, the thought leadership. We have a couple more segments that we're going to do. You're welcome to stay on, or if you need to uh, take off for a fabulous Friday evening date night, um, feel free to, to just jump off. But we really appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Damien. That's right. I am still here. Uh, <laughs> I was just listening. We take turns. Yes. So you don't want to take a shot at word of the day? Word of the week, I'm sorry. Yeah, word of the week from any God. Now, this word is stridulent, I would say. Um, to make a shrill creaking noise by rubbing body parts together. Oh, that's like my teenage years. <laughs> I thought that might be fun. I like. I didn't realize there was a word for the shrill creaking noises that when my children were rubbing their body parts together. Mm. So, if it's a you know you're alone and it's dark, are you stridulating? Um, I don't even want to go there. No. I, mm. Anyway, there you go. Stridulate. You're not going to get that in the sentence. No. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's do a prompt. All right. So here's here's today's prompt. Immigration is so common for both of our for both of our countries that we often forget the essence of an Im an immigrant moment is that people are people are leaving their homes forever. They're leaving where they were brought up. For a new country or a new world forever mm. so what is that like to to make that jump you might know from personal experience you can write about that or imagine what it was like to just pack it all up throw your throw you and your, your family into a creaky boat and be shipped off to parts unknown what are the feelings of that because i sometimes think that we lose touch once we've been in a in a situation for three four generations so write about what that first generation was going through. I think, I think without getting political, I think immigration gets a bit of a bad rap. Um, probably, oh, yeah, it does. Because I, well, I'm from an immigrant country. You're from an immigrant country. Yeah. <laughs> like, how else were we going to populate? Well, my, my mum and her family came over in the 60s from, uh, 60s, 70s from England. They were what they called 10-pound poms. And... I, I've, I've asked my mum this before. I can't remember the answer because I'm on antibiotics and drugs at the moment. But um, <laughs> it's an interesting thing. Like how do you come to that conclusion where you have an offer, like Australia had their 10-pound scheme, that you say to your family, you know what, I'm going to pack up, we're going to pack up and we're going to leave. We're going to leave what we know, our you know extended families, and we're going to go to another country and that's going to yeah. be our life. How do you get that and how do you convince I mean, my grandparents came over with, with their four or five children. Yeah. That's a big, yeah. big upheaval. And I hear mixed things. I hear, you know, my pop never really liked it or my nan didn't like it at certain points and they cross over. They always wanted to go yeah. back home, but they didn't. It's fascinating. Um, yeah, I think it is. And I think you're right. I think that um, uh, particularly, I, maybe maybe both Australia and the U.S., I, we just we have all this, you know, immigration we've always had immigration up people if, if people weren't worried about the you know mexicans coming up through the borders in cal into california a hundred years ago they were worried about the irish and then another hundred years ago they were worried about the english because of the first people up so there's always been turmoil and i just think that you know i want to i think it'd be interesting to think about what is the other side of that what would drive you to need to leave yeah. your rotating country and and make a go of it in in what could very well be in hostile environment you have snakes where you are yeah 
I was watching a show about that where they're talking about it. I don't know. Sometimes I think you Californians think you're the center of the world. And yeah, some, oftentimes the Californians think we're the center of the world. Unless you watch, you know, a, the latest disaster flick, San Andreas, then, yeah. Yes, but then this show was, someone was saying, uh, you know, here in California, we've, we've got the worst, we're the shark capital of the world. Uh, have you been to Australia? <laughs> <laughs> So I think we can have smackdowns about dangerous animals, sharks, yeah. jellyfish, <laughs> wine. There's a lot we can do. Yeah. No, I think, you know, if they wanted to stop the immigration problems, they should just start bringing in schemes like we used to, like the 10-pound pond scheme, and actually say, you know what, you pay $10, $10 you can come here. I don't know what we're afraid yeah. of. We've got, like, we're the biggest island in the world with a, a shit ton of desert. Just whatever. <laughs> anyway, we've got a lot come of Come out now and see what you can do with it, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, why not? Throw that challenge out there. See what you can do with that <laughs> space that we refuse to live in. That's what we did to, to populate the middle of our country, which if left to its own devices looks a lot like the middle of your country. Hmm. Um, it was like, come on down. We, you know, we'll give you free land if you can grow crops out of the dust, essentially. And you know, it was it was quite the scheme, and it and it really had a big failure in the 30s. Hmm. So that's there's all sorts of things that that have uh, we've used to lure people into undesirable areas and said, come on in and make something of this. Yeah, but then they also did go way overboard and create Las Vegas. So you know. Yep. And Las Vegas is itself. What can we say? Mm, all right. Very American city. <laughs> yeah, it is. Lots of lights and fat people. Now, let's do tortured sentence. <laughs> Next time, don't put the Roman farces on the rocket slab. <laughs> tortured sentences. That was my tonsils. That was your doctor when yeah. he looked into your throat again. <laughs> it was, yeah. Oh, oh well. He gets his, uh, he earned his, his money that day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so where did this one come from? This is from a student. Awesome. The answer lies with different opinions and arguments that generate controversial views to this issue that are valid. That's a lot of words that, was this a, like, a politician in your class? No, it's just, um, this is one of those examples of you have an idea at the beginning of the sentence and it runs completely away from you by the end. Oh, the answer. It's not even, it's not even a run on sentence. I call them run away sentences. It is a bit. <laughs> to start and then it just, it goes and it's, and it's over by the time you hit the full stop at the end. Yeah. I think you could cut out probably three quarters of that and it still get to the point. Yes, you could. But people loathe to do that because it's the whole word count, how many words in your essay, how many words in your novel. It's yeah, I I see that I see why this happens, but it, it still entertains me when it does. Mm. <laughs> I um had an interesting moment. I I took the van in to be repaired uh, for service. And they they told me it was gonna be an hour, but I ended up sitting there for three. But I had my laptop and I thought, what a great chance to just sit and write. You, know, you sit there, there's no Wi-Fi, there's nothing. Yeah. There. And I opened up my laptop and I went, you know what? I've got nothing. I reread what I'd already written, so most of it. I was like, no, nope, it's not sparking the next, next sentence. I then tried to just like force it a bit. You know, you just got to start somewhere. Yes. And I'm like, no, nah, you can tell I'm forcing this. This makes no sense. It's rubbish. I didn't even find it. I, in the end, and it, maybe it was because, yes, I was – I've been feeling quite crook and under the weather. I ended up just closing and just sitting there. I thought, I'm just sitting here like an old man. <laughs> <laughs> just have one of those. Um, well, you could say that you were meditating or something and just say, oh, I'm just sitting here being mellow, la, 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 uh, sitting here. Well, it was 8 o'clock in the morning. And they, I don't know. They had the morning TV on, which I can't stand. Oh, yeah. Happy people in the morning is ridiculous. But, yeah, and I tried actually writing something else, different topic, you know, that's what you and I have been sort of talking about with some ideas bouncing backwards and forwards. And even that, I just, after a page, I went, no, nah, this is torture. I <laughs> just know. <laughs> just no. So, anyway, um, we forgot to get Denise to do a shout-out. I know, but I just, we're, I'm just moving her along, but that's that's okay. Uh, that's all right. That's okay. Do you have a shout-out for your for your doctors? Not really. <laughs> well, my only shout out is that I'm not going to be around for three weeks. 
Oh, well, that sucks. Well, it doesn't actually because, well, you're not sorry about it according to the notes. No, I am not sorry about it according to the notes. <laughs> so are you going to, because you're going, you're going to Paris. Yes. You know the thing about where I'd like to get little knickknacks from around the world. You're going to send me like a stale baguette. Oh, that's a great idea. I could send you a stale baguette. Yeah. In fact, I should make a little note. I forgot that I need to give you something weird. <laughs> I'm going to be in France. I don't know how weird, and I need to. And I'm going to ship you wine. I swear. I just needed to. Um, I we need to get wine shippers. We had just thrown away some, and I said, "Oh, I can use those to ship Damien some wine." And Andrew says, "I just threw it. Sorry oh, about that." That's unacceptable. He loses a point. So just you have to hang out, hang, hang in there, and I'll get you some wine. That's all right. So beard gift for Damien. Yeah, and it can be you know even like a Frenchman's mustache. That's fine. <laughs> A book, a book of arrogance. I don't know if I'll ever, ever, ever be able to top the little the little mints that were in shape of body parts. I had to get rid of them, unfortunately. Why? Because I was cleaning up and a certain child may have found them. Ah. Uh, <laughs> well, they they disappeared. But anyway. Um so that'll that'll do it for this week. Should probably sign the yeah. show off before yeah. you know, we rambling. Yeah, time, and I wanted to take over for you because you weren't feeling well. Yes, so. thank you for that. So next week, who's on? Have we got a guest booked? I think we do. Um, I don't know if you have. Oh, hold on. Look, look, I was just making a note to to get you something weird ass. Um, we have Catherine yes, Grubb. Have Catherine Grubb is going to be on with you. We're going to give her another try. She she couldn't she couldn't get the. I don't know if it was a timing or. Her systems weren't working, but she's willing to try it again. So if you're going to talk to Catherine next week and then the week after that, you can talk to anybody you'd like. Awesome. Just find some random person. But I think... Yeah, I think of, so off the streets. You could do that. It's probably good that you're not here next week because that would do my head in trying to talk to two Catherines at the same time. <laughs> so at least there'll be one, and if you make a mistake, you'll be right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So Catherine, then I don't get... Yeah, stereo, yes. Come back. <laughs> Oh. So good. I'm glad we're not going to give you a headache. Oh, sorry, go on. All right. Well, that'll do it. So, yeah, tune in next week to listen to me. Hopefully, I'm better by then. I should be. Oh, yes. Thanks to Denise for being on. And uh, have a good trip. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Until next week. See you then. See you then. Your book starts here on the Newbie Writers Podcast.